across Wisconsin from Civic Media. This is Up North News Radio. Now, live from our Lake Wissota studio, here's the founding editor of Up North News, Pat Brightlow. Hey, good morning. Welcome back. It is 7.06 on this Thursday morning, January 4th, 2024. And again, coming up this morning, we'll uh, bring back our friend, OBGYN, former candidate, Kristen Lyerly, who is going to kick off the new year by talking about ways to lift up and encourage women who might be considering big public changes in 2024. It might be a run for office, but it might be other ways in, to get involved in improving the state of our communities and our political bodies. So Kristen will talk to us about that coming up at the bottom of the hour. Mark Jacob will join us in just a sec. Normally, our Friday 7.30 guest uh, joining us a day early. We've got a couple of special guests tomorrow related to the state Supreme Court throwing out the current gerrymandered maps and also on the occasion of the upcoming anniversary of the January 6th uh, insurrection against the government of the United States. So we'll talk to Mark Jacob in just a bit. First, 7 o'clock temperatures around Wisconsin go like this. It's uh, 18 up here in Chippewa Falls. Hey, Edwards at 16, Park Falls 15. Wausau, you're coming in at 19 degrees right now. Green Bay 20. La Crosse is at 26. Wisconsin Rapids 22. Oshkosh 24. It's 20 degrees in Madison. It's 25 right now in Waukesha. And Civic Media meteorologist Brittany Merlot joins us now to talk to us more, not just about today's forecast, but some of the odds for lighter snow in the near term, maybe a little more than lighter snow in the far term. Let's hear all about it from Brittany. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, we've got a mix of all wonderful Wisconsin weather headed our way. <laughs> you sure do. All right. So when do, when might we start seeing some of this? All right. So today we're pretty nice and calm. We've got a high pressure moving in. So this is the most sunshine we're going to see in quite a while. So if you love the sun, get outside and soak it up today. It's a little crisp and cool, though. The teens right now. With the winds, it really feels like the single digits. So it's going to smack you a little bit as you walk outside this morning. But highs today climbing into the upper 20s, beautiful and sunny, nice and calm. Tomorrow will start off bright and beautiful, but we'll start to get cloudy, staying cool still into the mid-20s and low 30s. Our first shot of some snowfall hits the northern part of the state. This kind of swipes across Lake Superior. So, of course, the south shore, the snow belt, and the northern counties, Eau Claire, Wausau, we might get a little bit of that. But anywhere from one to three inches of snowfall expected. This will be Saturday and winding down on Sunday. Now, chances of some more pockets of sunshine do move in on Sunday, but then the next system starts to push towards the Great Lakes. This is the one that everyone's starting to talk about, the big snowmaker. Where is it going to go? What's it going to do? Well, the models have been all over the place so far. Now they're starting to line up, and the track is wanting to take the storm south and towards Chicago mostly. So the bigger hitting snowfall, not really headed towards Wisconsin. Now it could hit towards Racine, Kenosha, uh, Milwaukee, but of course with that lake and the warm temperatures off of that, we could see more rain mixing in. So it's still a big storm. It's still a few days away. Things can change, but... As of right now, it's looking to go south at the moment. All right. We'll keep uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, but, but, but more importantly, if you take anything away from this forecast and why we love having Brittany here, when she tells you, quote, the wind is going to smack you a little bit, you'd better take this seriously. <laughs> so, hey, Brittany, yeah. thanks so much. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you as Talk well. All right, talk to you tomorrow. Uh, Brittany Merlot, Civic Media Meteorologist uh, there. And now Mark Jacob uh, joins us uh, from Chicago area to, Chicago, what do we say, Chicago land? Is that what we call it down there? Some, some people say that. Okay, but, some or, people. Or they say, you know, Metro Chicago land, which is redundant. That you know? really is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm actually from Evanston, which is, you know, but the bordering suburb north of Chicago. Ah, see, the thing here is that there's obviously Madison, Milwaukee, and then when people say, well, what do you call the rest of the state? And people have tried to use words like, you know, upstate, outstate. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to hear outstate. I've always liked the term greater Wisconsin because it's it's out there <laughs> and it's a pretty great place to be. But there there is no one thing the way that you have like, you know, Chicagoland or the Twin Cities. So, you know, we have we have things to work on here. Hey, thanks for uh, being flexible and talking to us uh, on a Thursday here. It's already been a, a busy week, of course. But 
I want to start with the ways that the news is busy in ways that don't necessarily reflect on what is truly important in terms of of people and policies and issues. And as you know, what really triggered this for me was um, a, a a long Twitter thread put out by uh, David Roberts, uh, who is a, a, a news a newsletter writer, uh, writes about politics and energy and things like that. And I, I couldn't possibly read the whole thing, but you and I both exactly knew what he was talking about when he talks about the controversy at at Harvard. And then before that, it was CRT and all of these other things where right-wing media types and political types are flat out telling you they're doing this on purpose. They're concocting a controversy uh, like Bud Light, I mentioned that earlier, right, right. to get people mad about something and not think about the ways that, in this case, say Republicans controlling the House, have done absolutely nothing this year except try to gen up these controversies. Well, right, right. You know, they and and let's you know let's just say what's really important here. So we're like about two weeks away from a, a deadline as far as part of the government having to shut down. Yet the House Republicans decided that they were going to go on vacation for three weeks. So. You know, to me, that's a lot more important than the, this kind of ginned up stuff that uh, the guy, the main guy who's trying to push this is a right wing radical named Christopher Rufo. And, and he, you know, and a lot of other kind of culture warriors, you just want to pick out little things to, you know, to appall people and also to suggest that, uh, that you know, white males are the people who are uh, treated badly in the society. And, you know, if you pay any attention, you've read any history, you know that that it's you know basically the 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 demographic group that's been you know hurt most by policies and you know this government and this pol this country you know is not white men so uh you know this so so this this kind of invented victimhood is part of the whole problem and and you know and and it's easy to you know when when everyone feels like oh well something went went bad for me today or 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 it's just not things are just not fair for me today everyone has those impulses to feel that way and and these right wing culture warriors feed into that and make people feel like they're victims when they're really not. And it's one thing if they were to do that and, and they could do it through, say, paying for their own communication. What what David Roberts is writing about and what really hit home for me and I know for you as well is the way that the the media uh, and, as he puts it, the center left pundit class approaches mm -hmm. these things. They simply accept whatever frame, whatever narrative is put out there by the right. And then they focus within that frame. So instead of saying what's motivating them to talk about these things, they go ahead and take at face value. Oh, this must be an actual grievance because if we actually look at the motivation behind it, we will look biased when that's actually right. where the real story is. Well, you know, Pat, I kind of think that it's media laziness to a large extent. Yes. Because you, because you're totally right. And Roberts is totally right that, that the right wing has been fantastic at setting the agenda and at, at just in taking something out of nowhere that really doesn't matter the bud light thing you know the nfl players kneeling you know and turning that into like the most important and, and appalling thing when it really wasn't it was just a quiet peaceful protest before a football game but but they will take things like that and just blow them out of proportion and the media just goes along just like they're a dog on a leash and it's and, and it's and it's it's embarrassing and it's dangerous for our country i i would like to see responsible news media set their own agenda sit in a room talk about what's important and go cover it and it sure as hell isn't the kind of stuff that these right-wing culture warriors are doing and, you know one example i don't know if you've talk, talked about it on your show or whatever but lindsey graham cooking up this chick-fil-a thing in new york have you followed that ever so briefly but of course i knew right away that, that this was something concocted so we didn't talk about it here but what we also didn't hear from other media sites you know again the question of why are they bringing that up instead right. of being forced to t to talk about what they're bringing up right right well then, just a quick summary so New York State, some legislator in New York says, hey, it's really ridiculous that Chick-fil-A is in all of our throughway rest stops, but they're closed on Sunday. That's not really our service to travelers. We ought to, if they're going to have a state contract at these throughway rest stops, they ought to be open on Sunday. And Lindsey Graham went on Fox and, and totally fuzzed the issue and made it seem as if New York is trying to force all Chick-fil-A's to be open on Sunday because it's religious discrimination. <laughs> And you know, and Fox News went along. I mean, 
They, it, there was a terrific article in the Washington Post yesterday about the Gateway Pundit and how that's a, a incredibly irresponsible news uh, outlet. You know, right wing just make up lies, 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 lies. You know, and they've been lying about uh, various election fraud that didn't happen for three years, and they won't stop. They'll keep on doing it. And and the, this article kind of points out how that kind of thing is this kind of opening. So as soon as they publish something, all these other slightly less lying right-wing news outlets can report it. And so, so it becomes this echo chamber in which something that's not important and not true in any way gets just bounced around the, uh, you know, the social media and Fox News and Newsmax and all these kind of lying news outlets. And the thing is, if you were to go back uh, and, and look in to, again, Chick-fil-A is just the latest thing. There was the the Bud Light that we mentioned before, uh, the green M&M controversy, right. you know, that has come and gone. That I don't even remember what it was. Minnie about. Mouse with a pantsuit, you uh, know, wearing a pantsuit. I mean, yes. that, that was, I, I was distressed for days about the fact that Minnie Mouse <laughs> wore a pantsuit. Right. Or as people are now pointing out, I, I saw several references this morning about why is the plagiar, the alleged plagiarism by the leader of Harvard being questioned for so long when we still haven't come to the issue of Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, who it's pretty clear plagiarized things for his book. How does he get a pass? Why wasn't that more of a story? Well, again, because there wasn't concocted outrage about that story. Yeah, but a part of it also is that the left wing doesn't go places that the right wing will go. Right. And and they want to be and, above it all. You know? Yes, yes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, and, and, you know, Michelle Obama said, you know, when they go low, we go high. And my view of that is that when you when you go high and they're going low, they're going to take your knees out. Yeah. And, and, and I just don't believe in that. I think that I think you got to fight fire with fire. I think you need to be honest. I don't believe in lying right. because that's wrong. Uh, you know, and, and it's amazing here we are in 2024 and I've got to like state for the record that lying is wrong because so many people are doing it. And That's right. They're, they're, they are. And, and they're they're good with it as long as it benefits them. And we're going to yeah. talk more about that on the other side of this break and get back to a point that you raised earlier as well about setting an agenda and the, the difference between setting an agenda for news coverage versus setting an agenda for, you know, working the media. We'll talk more about that with Mark Jacob in just about 90 seconds here, wherever you're listening across Wisconsin on this Thursday morning. When you're here, you're up north. We'll be back in just a bit across the Civic Media Radio Network. Still ahead, Kristen Lyerly at 7.30 and Luke Mathers at 7.50. But Mark Jacob is with us uh, right now for the next uh, couple of minutes here. We were talking, uh, I was talking earlier this week about how Up North News is four years old this week, created by Courier Newsroom. Uh, we are the digital media outlet for them. Uh, we have uh, outlets in several states and one of the things that's different about us is that we feel like news consumers deserve to know the values that shape a newsroom's decisions. And ours have always been on our about page, upnorthnewswi.com slash about dash us, and you'll find it there. And, but it's not just the values, which again, you cover your news rooted in facts. It's like Mark, the conversations I used to have as both a news anchor and a politician where they people could ask me anything i'll tell you what i think i'll tell you the facts as i know them i will never lie about them which is not what other people can say then when it comes to an agenda i i agree with you and it's something i i've wanted to do um quite frequently is to set an agenda not like we're going to make this thing happen but we're going to cover this important issue and tell you what people are doing to make it happen or not happen. Is is that kind of along your same thought line in terms of what you know, how newsrooms should have an agenda instead of chasing the next shiny object? Yeah, exactly. And 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 what I'm talking about is is news leaders of a news organization sitting in a room and 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 not not saying, okay, how are we going to get Donald Trump? That's not and, and that doesn't happen. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of conspiracy theorists want to think it does. It doesn't. 
But what they ought to be doing is sitting in a room and saying, what's important to our readers? What's important to our community? And, uh, and when you look at that, you might want to say, well, you know, the democracy seems to be, you know, hanging on by a thread here. Uh, and the guy who's running for president from a major political party has decided that he wants to be a dictator and uh, has decided that, you know, that he's called for the execution of a former general. He's uh, you know, talked about terminating the Constitution. These are all super serious things. And there's almost like nothing more important. So let's go cover that. And, and that's not Again, Pat, this is not us deciding to do it because you know just because we want to go get somebody. This is us concluding that what's most important to the safety and freedom of our readers and our, our viewers, and then making decisions based on that. Also, this whole thing, and I'm glad you pointed out the Courier thing as far as 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 making clear what the values are because. Every news organization has values. I don't believe in media objectivity. I don't believe it exists. I think some people pretend it exists, and that's why you see the New York Times kind of and the Washington Post and other major media pretend that the Republicans are, are telling the truth when they're lying. They think that that's fair if they give them a say, even though they are just passing on things they know are untrue. And, uh, and that's false objectivity, and it's dangerous to our society. Much better is uh, when news organization says, as Courier does, you know, you know, I believe, you know, when uh, that everyone has should get health care in this country. I believe, you know, it, in women's rights and and various things like that. And the, because I, mean, I was a news, I was an editor who assigned reporters to do things. I made value judgments every day based on what I thought the readers wanted and what they needed. Both things we need and want. And, uh, and, and I wasn't covering every story. I didn't go out to tell a reporter, go cover everything. I picked and chose, and that is a value judgment. That's not objective. If I was objective, I would have said, well, just go cover everything. But that wouldn't have worked. We make value judgments every time in the news business, and that's good if we make the right judgments. Right. And in, in the case of Up North News, for example, if you go to the About page, one, one of our values listed here is, is called A Strong Democracy. Right. saying access to the ballot box is essential for Wisconsinites to have a say in how our state is run. Um, a strong electorate is an informed electorate, not one divided by fear and lies. A free press is only possible through democracy, so we will not take a both-sides approach to those whose words or deeds are hostile to free and fair elections or who threaten the daily norms that allow our government to operate efficiently and serve all the people. In other words, we're not just going to say, you know, so-and-so says we should, you know, slash government, or we're going to say, well, slashing government would hurt people in this way, because right. this is what government is supposed to do to function efficiently, not democratic efficiently, not Republican efficiently, just efficiently for all. And, and this is really important. And I think Courier gets this also, which is that is the idea that let's base it on what's best for the, the public. Let's not base it on what's best for the politicians. You know, the, don't turn everything into a horse race. Don't like, you know, oh, this is just an interesting little narrative about what DeSantis is saying about Haley, who's saying this about Trump. It, bring it back to what happens to real people based on these policies. Bring, make, it, make your news coverage centered on actual human beings who are affected by these policies, not turn it into some stupid video game that takes place in Washington, D.C. Yeah, uh, and, and that's the thing is is when you turn it into a, a, a game, and that's what it is. And that's you know, as we get to um, you know one of the stories making news just uh, yesterday and today. It's that all of these Republican members of Congress are at the southern border again, you know, talking as they always do about those immigrants and open borders. But Mark, there has been no shortage of ways that that members of both parties have been trying to create bipartisan immigration reform, and yet. They're taking time off for a photo op at the southern border, and that's what they're always, always going to do. Well, and it shows that on that particular issue, Republicans don't want to solve the border crisis. They want the crisis because it, they want to exploit it. They don't want to. They don't want to solve it. There was a quote yesterday from a congressman named Troy Nettles, and he said, "I'm not willing to do darn much." Uh, right now to help a Democrat and to help Joe Biden's approval rating. He was talking about how he, he didn't really want to vote for a compromise 
to work on border security and also allow Ukraine funding and Israel funding and, and various the, the, the whole package. He wants to block the whole package because he doesn't want to help Joe Biden's approval rating. Well, that that puts a lie to the idea that they're concerned about the border issue. It says they want to exploit the border issue, which is totally the truth. We've seen the same thing with uh, Republicans in the Wisconsin legislature saying, we don't want to give Tony Evers a win. And here's the thing. It's, it's as, if, as if for all of the things they've learned in life, they have forgotten the phrase win-win. Now, in the right. case of the legislature, I've said with a $7 billion surplus, there's no excuse not to find a win-win in there. And will, will it help Tony Evers or President Biden? Sure, but it also helps you. So don't now go to the voters and make your case. I don't know. What makes them still think that the case for gridlock is is the one that's going to be more successful? Well, I think because it's because the Democrats are in charge. So they feel like anything, any bad news for the American public is good news for them. And that's really, you know, that's really a bad place for a political party to be in as far as, uh, you know, I mean, it's dangerous because because they are pro chaos and and and. They are for government not working. They're hoping government doesn't work. They're hoping that they're actively trying to make government not work. And and it's just very destructive to our whole system, but probably good for them politically. And that's really all they care about. And that and that's a, the big tragedy of what's going on right now is that Republicans are interested in chaos. They're interested in the government not working. They're interested in their own political power and money and nothing else really matters. Uh, Mark works on Stop the Presses at stopthepresses.news. You can uh, also find links at couriernewsroom.com to work by Mark, by Kia Vakil, Carolyn Fiddler, and much more. And uh, again, we'll continue this discussion next week. Mark, thank you so much. Happy New Year to you. And you ha have a great start to the weekend. We'll catch you later. All right. All right. When we come back, uh, Kristen Lyerly is back with us, and we will talk about the ways that women can make a difference in 2024 across Wisconsin. That's coming up next. You're up north. So I, I asked Greg if he could uh, help with a bit more of the the bumper music and some of the other functions. And he says, oh, I've got something for Kristen here. And again, not not every bumper tune has to have a, a meaning. I just thought I'd ask Greg if, if there's anything behind this or, or if this is just, does this set the scene for Kristen Lyerly walking into a room? Because then I think bell bottoms, you know, <laughs> yes. and embroidered jeans. Yeah. Well, a uh, couple of things about this song. First of all, it's a song by the band you may know as uh, George Clinton and Funkadelic before nice. they went super funk. Uh, but I feel like it's 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 apropos for Dr. Lyerly because it's called You Hit the Nail on the Head. And generally, she always does. She yes, always she does. does. Always. Good. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to Up North News Radio on this Thursday, January 4th. And Kristen is our, our regular guest uh, Thursdays at 7.30. And now with the, the flip of the calendar um, and, you know, with Up North News marking, you know, the start of its fifth year of operation, we thought we'd chat a bit today about this particular segment and the direction that uh, seems to be right for it to take as we head into this new year, Kristen. We're switching it up, Pat. There you go. So I'm, last I'm, year we what? I was, say, I'm, 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 I was looking for a way to work Funkadelic into all this, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it fast enough. I'm gonna go have some more coffee while you talk. <laughs> when I think Pat quite low, I think funky. Funkadelic. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. You know, so last year we spent the whole year doing our segment called Hometown Health, which I really enjoyed. And I'm so grateful to you, Pat, for coming up with this idea and finding these treasures all across the state and some folks from outside talking about how all of these things like clean air and clean water and access to healthcare, all of these things uh, directly affect our healthcare, but we often don't think about it. And we're going to continue to talk about those topics, but it's not going to be condensed into this segment. We're going to just kind of spread that throughout the other Up North News stuff that's happening. Yeah, We're going to use this segment to feature women winning Wisconsin. 
And here's what I mean by that. 2024 is a really special year. There is so much at stake for all of us across the country. And Wisconsin really is the epicenter. When you look at the potential with our maps changing, the possibility that we may again be actually electing the people who we want to serve us instead of just being held hostage by our maps, that people are willing to step up again and serve, this is a time that is ripe for that change that we want to see. And this is a time where the issues that affect women disproportionately, like reproductive health care, like child care, like access to clean water and a healthy environment, all of these things are so important to all of us. But women really feel a lot of these issues more deeply. So this is the year 2024 that women win Wisconsin. Can I say in terms of the the maps and the potential, and it, it, it's not at all to, what's the, the phrase Greg says all the time, harsh or mellow, but it's- it, or, Yuck or your wet, yum. <laughs> or, or, be a, or be a wet blanket. But I, I come back to something Joe Zapecki said in the last hour. And again, it's, it's not to be negative, but to be realistic. New maps does not lead to necessarily a democratic- majority or even a big democratic gain any place this isn't about equal maps this isn't about democratic maps it's about fair maps fairer which means if the maps are fairer as he said there will be many more competitive races in legislative districts around wisconsin you still have to do the work you need good people to step up or you need good people to recruit other good people to step up and do the work because these issues are important women and their allies do show up and vote on these but not if you take it for granted well and in the past and i can really speak to northeastern wisconsin our maps have been so gerrymandered. I mean, of the 23 districts, that's the assembly districts, the Senate districts, and the congressional seat up here in the 8th congressional district, of the 23 seats that are going to be on the ballot in the fall, only two of those seats are currently held by Democrats. And we know that this area is much bluer than that. So we finally in this region are feeling hopeful. We're looking at these districts and recognizing that if we do run, we could potentially win if we're willing to put the work in. So we're, we're seeing that people are starting to step forward, starting to dip their toe in, starting to have conversations. And that's what we really want to encourage across the state. If this is something that you, woman or man, and this isn't just about women, but we definitely want to make sure that we are um, highlighting women because women have additional barriers to serving that men don't see. So just to give women a little bit of an extra boost as they're considering a potential candidacy. You know, you mentioned the the, the districts in Northeast Wisconsin, for example. I, I think you were the one that, that showed me how there's three different state Senate districts. And when you look at the three Republican senators, they're, they're all basically within a stone's throw of each other. And then the districts go way off in, in different directions to make sure that those three in that cluster could basically have three separate, you know, Senate districts. And you see it elsewhere around the state. And again, we, we've long since established that these maps are rigged, that they're corrupt. But new maps do mean that in some, some new districts, uh, are going to turn out to have no incumbent. Mm -hmm. You're going to be an open seat, and the opportunity is there. It's it's a lot easier to run for an open seat than to run against an incumbent of either party. We've always known that. It's really exciting. And when you look at the number of women that are currently serving in the legislature, there are 41, which is the most ever. The first time we had women serving in the legislature was 100 years ago. Back in 1925, there were three women, and now we have 41. So I think it would be helpful to step back for a second, just for our listeners. I mean, we know this information, but our listeners may not be as familiar. Our legislature is a full-time legislature. It is a big job. There are 33 senators. There are 99 assembly seats. It's, there are three assembly seats per Senate district. Eight of the 33 senators are women. 33 of the 99 assembly reps, one third are women. And some of those notable leaders are familiar names. You hear them on the show here. Sarah Godlewski, who actually originated the name Women Win Wisconsin. She was excited to share it with us, and I'm sure she'll be popping in at some point. Sarah Rodriguez, our lieutenant governor. 
um, former assembly person from uh, the Milwaukee area. We've got incredible leaders in the Senate with Diane Hesselbein at the helm for the minority, Melissa Agard, who just stepped back, Kelda Royce, of course, great friend of the show. And in the assembly, we've got Greta Neubauer, who is leading the charge, Lee Snodgrass, Jill Billings, Christina Shelton, Lisa Subek. These women know how to lead. And not only do they lead, but they mentor. They encourage others to step up. And that's really what it takes to get more women in leadership. Can I tell you how much it frightens me every time we start to read off a list of these incredible women? Because I'm always afraid I'm going to miss one of them. Because, and, <laughs> yes. and, and, and it's not that they, you know, they don't need to hear their own names, but they, they, they've earned it. They've earned that respect that comes with stepping up and being leaders that way. And, and to, to Sarah Godlewski for a moment, uh, and, and I, I do want to toot our own horn over here for a second since we're celebrating our, our four-year anniversary, but it was about a year ago that Sarah Godlewski um, was, you know, was not in office. She was the now former state treasurer. You know, she had run in the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate. And what she was doing about a year ago right now, before she actually created Women Win Wisconsin, was she was part of Up North News Radio in the morning and and occasionally helping us meet women in, you know, hometowns across the state and lifting them up and showing that, you know, there are people in, in every hometown that are leading the way. And this is, you know, now she went, Sarah went and got herself this, you know, new gig as Secretary <laughs> of State. Yeah. I guess that can compete with morning radio. I don't know. Yeah, but she's busy. She No, but she's she's remarkable that way. Then, of course, did the Women Win, Win Wisconsin group. And now uh, I'm I'm just so thankful that you are now essentially taking that baton into 2024 and helping elevate these voices, elevate these stories. It's our obligation, I think, as leaders to promote future leaders because we all stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. And, you know, speaking of that, if you look at the history of the assembly, we didn't have an African-American woman in the assembly until 1977. And do you know when we first elected a Latina to the assembly? Do you no. know what year it was? Nope. 2011, Pat. Wow. It was Jocasta, Z I'm going to say her name wrong. Zamar Zamaripa. Zamaripa. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, trivia question. How about the first Asian American woman? Do you know when she was elected? Francesca yeah. Hong. Yeah. French, our friend Francesca Hong. I so, love her. Oh, no, man. I love her more. So okay, okay fine. <laughs> I love her the most. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, fine. <laughs> you win this one, Lyrely. See if you get music now, people. <laughs> <laughs> but look at how we're building. Look at how we're acknowledging. And in the last few years, how we have been able to not just elect more women, but elect more women from different populations with different perspectives. And when you look at the Senate, it's even a little further behind. We didn't have a woman in the Senate until 1975. Five. Yeah. Yeah. But in 2015, Mary Lazich was elected Senate president. She was the first woman to serve as a presiding officer of either legislative house. We haven't had a woman speaker in the assembly yet, but I feel like it's coming. It's coming I soon. Too. I do. It, it, it Again, going to take a little work because these things don't happen by themselves. And by the way, it's not just stepping up and saying, I want to run for office. There needs to be people involved in fundraising and in promotion and get out the vote efforts. Uh, you know, my, my first campaign, you know, when I was uh, inaugurated to the Senate doing the math 17 years ago this week, yikes, I feel old. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was a campaign, you know, uh, run by, uh, you know, uh, Kathy Daggs Devine uh, and so many other women who have led the way on these things in, in terms of not just being the candidate, but getting the work done behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're so good at getting the work done behind the scenes, but it's harder for us to step up and be the candidate for so many reasons. Women are less likely to self-promote. They need more shoulder taps. So if you are out there and if there are women in your sphere who you know would be great, it's cool to say, hey, I would love to see you run for something. I would love to see you in this role because they need to hear it over and over again to know that that support is out there and to know that they, that people around them recognize that they are the right person for the job. You know what else they could do? 
Hmm. They could send us an email, radio at upnorthnewswi.com, <laughs> and tell us. Yeah, say, hey, there's this person who's thinking about running. I bet they'd be a great guest on your show. Oh, or, yeah. Or I'm thinking about running. I think I'd be a great guest on your show. <laughs> because what I always say is, you know, we're this is not the Psychic News Network. You actually have to let us know you're out there. <laughs> And then, then we can take part in things. Uh, I've got one minute left, so I'm, I'm, I'm cheating you on this, but I do have to ask quickly. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, somehow or another, made the ruling this week that emergency care abortion is not the same thing as essential life-saving care. These are Trump-appointed judges. I'm betting you disagree. I couldn't disagree more. I would like for these polit- these judges who are politicians to sit in the emergency department and help the doctors determine what they think is life-saving and not. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. When somebody presents to the emergency department, regardless of what their situation is, they're having a stroke, they're having a heart attack, they're vaginally bleeding because they are suffering from a miscarriage, they deserve to be treated, period. Yeah, full stop. And yet that's not what this saying. So of course, uh, this, this will end up in the Supreme court. And again, we'll get back to micromanaging, you know, women's health, which is, uh, you know, really, uh, I, I can't believe we're doing that in this day and age. One more quick note. Uh, this was an ABC news special about women. It was called delayed and denied all about women, uh, who were denied, um, care and what could have been, you know, life threatening conditions. Uh, they are still running that on Hulu now is where it streams, I guess. And you were part of that as well. I was. It's going to be on broadcast on Friday, I think. It, I did see that right then. Yes, tomorrow. It's ABC's going to going to rerun it. Yeah, it, please watch it. Please, mm-hmm. please watch it and watch it with people that you love. It is heartbreaking. They talk with women from all across the country who are from banned states who were denied care because of political efforts in their states, and to hear their stories and the stories of their partners who support them. I I I see this all the time. I cried. I cried the entire time. Yeah, prepare to, but it's an important message. Text message from a listener up in the Hayward area who says, you have an occasional guest who should run for something. Dr. Lyerly. (laughs) We we couldn't agree more, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Luke Mathers next. You're up north. Several different shows coming up across the Civic Media Radio Network. And if you want to learn more, you should go to civicmedia.us for a map of stations around Wisconsin and the many shows that you can hear online, on demand, uh, on air. Let's see, I've got another one coming into the text thing uh, from somebody listening to WXCO. It's always when Pat has Kristen on that funky audio stuff happens. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, is that like not fun, like not good funky? Well, someone I, said I, multiple voices. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, it could be that they hear. Can you imagine if, if they could hear the voices in my head as well as the voice coming out of my mouth or any of us as we're doing this? And it's, you know what? Someday, someday might be 500 years from now, but that's going to be able to happen. <laughs> you're listening to somebody. You're the but only you're one laughing about this, hearing, Pat. You're the only one I'm laughing about this. I'm laughing because I better be dead by then, but boy, oh boy. Mr. Mathers, how are you? Good. How you uh, feeling, buddy? Uh, better than yesterday, that's for sure. For oh, no. I'm amends. Uh, yeah, I unfortunately got hit with uh, some kind of bug. I was, I was so fortunate to avoid all the sicknesses with the niece and the nephews and all the mm-hmm. family events over the holidays. And then, uh, for whatever reason, I got a 24-hour thing. Hopefully, oh. it's a 24-hour thing. Uh, but I think it's worked its way through the system. So I, I feel very... Very happy that uh, my uh, younger grandkids, uh, they typically do give me a a nasty head cold because they always seem to have one themselves from daycare. And I didn't get it this time. Sherry did. Sherry got a nasty head cold. But I, I figured fate was fate had something else in store for me which is what came yesterday, which led to our discussion off the top of the show with Greg about how after everything that I had done at the doctor's office yesterday, I remain convinced as ever that if men had to get pregnant and put up with the, the level of pain down there that women did, human race would be gone in no time, no time flat if men had to be the one to get pregnant. Look how Kristen's just kind of nodding. Like, no yep, one's Pat, disagreeing yep. with you, Pat. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Just leave that out there where it lays. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just reflect on that for yeah. a moment. No, 
because again, you know, as the nurse is apologizing, I'm like, yeah, you know who my wife is. <laughs> She's an OBGYN. <laughs> I'm not going to complain about this even a little bit because again, men's health is very important too. And that means mm-hmm. sometimes getting poked and prodded and that's, that's just what you do. Or in the case of Mr. Mathers, you rest and you take it easy because he's he's still he's still young he's still youthful he can fight this thing with and a little handsome bit of rest. and capable. that's where I was going for Greg yep I knew that and you fair would suck up to the boss and that kind way. So, yep <laughs> Mr Mathers what would you like to tell us about in civic media world these days uh you know weekend shows or things anything in the new evening? coming up how's that how's that how's that uh well, well we've talked about Jane Matinair getting a great new show in the mornings with uh, also with Greg Bach um I, I was I was thinking more like you know we we haven't mentioned nearly enough the the new uh Pete Schwaba experience nightlight with Pete Schwaba yeah well uh right after Pete launched you know somebody decided to pack up his bags and head south for the winter so we haven't had a lot of Thursday opportunities to talk about it yet yeah <laughs> Oh, that's wow. another one. Wow. Oh, I had to make sure I got my jab in. For, uh, for, for the folks episode. who might have missed that, oh, 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 you might have oh. missed it. I don't know how you could have missed it, but I went on a two-week vacation, and I have not heard the end of it yet. So, uh, No, but Mr. Schwaba, uh, out of our WGBW studios up in Green Bay, doing an excellent job with Nightlight with Pete Schwaba every weeknight from 8 to 10 p.m., covering a lot of the lighter side of news, entertainment, culture, pop culture, Uh, What's going on in the movies, television, all of those things. Uh, So Pete and his producer Conrad have been having about a month worth of shows now. And we're really excited. It's it's been a terrific show. If you haven't yet tuned into Nightlight from 8 to 10, don't know what you're doing. You're missing out because you can get all the way to Hollywood and back and still be in bed at 10 p.m. as the show likes to talk about. So it is an excellent experience. Pete's joined by a, a number of tremendous guests. He's got a, a quite a background of himself as a comedian, as a movie producer, as a reporter with us here at Civic Media, and now a evening talk show host from 8 to 10 p.m. every Monday through Friday. So that's a that's part of the book ending that I wanted to talk about with the the broadcast day for Civic Media. Then at the at the front end of it, it used to be this radio program, but now uh, in Amory, in Hayward, in Oshkosh, and in Richland Center, uh, the day actually gets started at 5 a.m. with Pam Yankee. Yeah, so we've got the the. Fabulous farm babe, Pam Yonke, for the Midwest Farm Report. Uh, as you said, every weekday on those stations from 5 to 6 a.m. So, yeah, Pat, we've we found somebody that uh, was crazy enough to wake up even earlier than you. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Pam does a tremendous job uh, with the Farm Report. It's not just about farms as well. It's about a whole lot more than that. So, uh, talking about all of the, the aspects that farmers need to know, but everything from food to table as well. So, getting into where our food comes from and and a huge part of the way of life here in Wisconsin, agriculture, uh, is, is a really great program that we're excited to offer on several different civic media stations uh, and we're hoping to continue to roll out even more programming throughout 2024 so you're going to want to stay tuned i I recall when uh there was discussion about starting a 5 a.m program that uh you know included farm markets and news and things like that and people kind of looked at me and i was like yeah i'm already up that early Uh, it was (laughs) kind of that look like i could do it i don't want to get up an hour earlier yeah because I, I look at my old, my, one of my old uh, 10 o'clock co-anchors now does the, uh, on TV, now does the early morning uh, shift, and he gets up at 2.30 every morning because their newscast begins at 4.30. What time do you go to bed? I mean, uh, yeah. 6 p.m.? <laughs> well, that's what I used to do when I was doing morning radio. I'd go to bed at 6.30, 7 p.m., you know, in order to get up at 2.30, 3 o'clock. And I'm not saying I, I couldn't do it. I, I just don't want to <laughs> if, I, if I could possibly avoid it. But there are definitely some days in the winter where I could be in bed at 6.30. When it oh, is yeah. dark. Oh, these 4.30. Days. Yeesh. Yeah. When you can beat, when you can beat, when you can beat, <laughs> you can go to bed before the sun goes down. Oh, that's a good feeling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and once again, uh, Dr. Lyerly just kind of sits and stares at us as somebody who has to be awake at all hours and might be awake for 36 hours straight. And this this segment is not designed to get sympathy from Kristen Lyerly in one area or the other. You know, I am not looking for sympathy. I love my job. Also, I, I, I would think Dr. Lyerly would, give, would want us to get good sleep and would feel bad if we don't get good sleep. 
Thank you, Greg. Yeah, 100%. Well, gosh, we is also Hansley. working to get that 24-hour broadcast clock so that no matter what hour Dr. Lyerly is awake at, she'll have some <laughs> excellent programming to listen to. Or, or can nice. call in and, and go home. <laughs> nice pivot, that's boss. Even, nice pivot. Yeah, way to go. You're a very talented boss. That's that's for darn sure. Uh, Kristen, you will be on uh, today. Uh, are we still calling the segment Public Cervix Announcement? We are. All We're right. going to talk about uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Okay. Nice man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I get All right. hyper too, man. No, I get some chill. <laughs> chill. Kristen, thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Mathers, have a great day. You too, Pat. Greg, thank you. Now, tomorrow we'll have a couple of special guests here. Uh, we'll have a former Dane County Sheriff talking about the an- anniversary of January 6th and the attack on uh, the, the U.S. government. And we'll have a guest from Law Forward talking about the state Supreme Court tossing out those corrupt legislative rigged maps. That's all tomorrow morning, starting at 6 a.m., live from Lake Wissota across the Civic Media Radio Network. Have a great day.